It's been more than a month now since the first pro-Palestinian protests over the war in Gaza started up on Canadian campuses. We want that war. We want that war. And I'm happy to see the students mobilize for justice, for peace. I'm here to show support to the students who have formed an encampment to build awareness. I think this is an amazing way of protesting and camping. I mean, this isn't this is something new. It's been done for a really long time. So our fundamental demand is total divestment from all companies supporting or complicit in the current genocide and occupation of Palestine. These protests are calling on universities to cut ties with organizations connected to the Israeli military and with many Israeli academic institutions. Some of the protests are causing friction on campus. Some are facing court injunctions. Some saw police intervention. And some have been peacefully resolved. It's a lot to keep track of. So today, the Globe's post-secondary education reporter, Joe Friesen, is on the show. He'll tell us where these campus protests are at right now, what the students are asking for, and how the universities are responding. I'm Manika Raman-Wilms, and this is The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. Joe, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. So we're about a month into the protests on campuses across Canada. I guess, how would you just characterize this moment in the protests? It's a, it's a really interesting moment right now because the protests have been going on for a while now. A few have been resolved. Many still remain uh, ongoing, especially some of the big ones, UBC, U of T, McGill, for example. And the question is, will they be able to find a resolution? Hmm. So finding a path forward right now for, for university administrations is, I think, the, the main task. And for the, for the students in the encampment, they're, they're still hoping to get many of their demands met. I think, at least in my recent memory, this is one of kind of the biggest moments of student activism that I really remember in, in Canada. Yeah, I can't remember anything like this. I've been covering universities for about five years, and uh, there have been some big movements around climate and some successful attempts to get universities to divest from, from fossil fuels. But to see so many campuses go into this encampment phase so quickly is really remarkable. So how many have we seen naturally do that? Do we know how many protests are across Canada? I don't have an exact number. There was a while there in mid-May where it seemed there was a new campus every day, and I was having a hard time keeping up. But I would think it's definitely over two dozen would be my, my best estimate. It could be even more than that. Okay. And these, of course, are following similar protests that happened at several universities in the U.S. So how does what's happening there compare to what's happening here in Canada? The U.S. ones, they started a little earlier than the ones in Canada, and they were much more contentious, I think, from, from the university standpoint. So there were more efforts to crack down on them. And we saw some violence as encampments were cleared uh, from police in some cases, and there were also clashes with counter-protesters. Uh, so Canada has mostly seen relatively peaceful protests so far. Not many campuses have seen police go in, but there have been a couple examples. And for the most part, universities are pursuing negotiation as the main tactic and trying to be patient and wait out the protesters, I think. So let's actually get into some of what we see in, in detail in Canada then. The protests here have similar requests. What are the students calling on universities to do? So the, the Canadian protests have been pretty focused and they have three demands, typically. It's not exactly the same at every campus, but it's pretty close. And they're calling for universities to disclose where their money is invested. Universities all have... Uh, endowment funds of some kind or pension funds where pools of money are being placed and they want to know where that is going. The second thing is they're, they're calling on universities to divest from companies connected to the Israeli military or to weapons manufacturers. And the third is to break ties. And this one has been a difficult one for universities to deal with, I think, because the protesters want to see universities cut ties with academic institutions in Israel uh, if they are connected to the Israeli military in some cases or if they operate in the occupied settlements in other cases. So 
Universities have responded on that point in particular that they don't believe in academic boycotts for the most part. So that's been a point of contention. Hmm. Okay. Uh, There's been a lot going on at different campuses, right? And it has been actually kind of hard to keep track of things at at times. So I think it is worth maybe going through some of them in more detail. So let's start with the protests in Toronto here at U of T. You've been to this one a couple of times, I know. What is it like there? So when you get there to King's College Circle, which is sort of the main green at the heart of the U of T St. George campus, uh, usually a very nice place where people are playing Frisbee and, and congregating, Um, The U of T put up a temporary fence uh, a couple days before the protest started. I think having seen what happened in the U.S. and trying to head off a protest getting started on its grounds, uh, the protesters were able to get over that fence. And so they are located inside that fenced off circle. And around the fence, you see all kinds of banners with slogans uh, related to the Israel-Gaza war some tarps. And then on the inside of the fence is a fairly large encampment of about 100 to, you know, sometimes more, maybe 125 tents. Uh, It has grown from the early days when it was about 50 tents. And they are arranged. uh, I was looking at some aerial photos. I was surprised to see they are arranged in rows often. And so Mm. there's, there are kind of almost streets that run through this place. It seems fairly well organized. You know, there's always food, there's a medical tent in some places at McGill, for example, you know, there's a library. I think there's one at U of T also. So they're finding ways to make this a place where they can live for the long term. And do we know who is at this protest then? Well, when the the student leaders are asked if everyone there is a student, they get Mm. quite adamant that yes, everyone is sleeping in that encampment is or is connected to U of T. Of course, you can be connected to U of T in many different ways. And we did hear some faculty say that they are staying there. So it's very hard to know. It's, it's, it's difficult to say. And I've certainly heard people on the, uh, the counter protest side saying that these are clearly not U of T students. And when you look at the level of organization and the, the logistics that they have managed, you do, you know, it, it does raise questions about how they knew to do all these things so efficiently. But, uh, you know, these are, these are sharp kids. Yeah. You know, one, one of the things that struck me about it was they waited until after the exams were over to, uh, to begin this encampment of U of T. So their academics are also a priority, I think. Yes, exactly. Huh. Um, what kind of response have we seen from the university then? At U of T, they have described their response as being patient. They've been trying to engage in negotiations with the students. And then a little more than a week ago, they said their patience was starting to run out. Uh, they were getting frustrated with the way that this crucial part of campus was being uh, taken over for the exclusive use of the protesters, a place you know, where normally lots of people from the campus gather and from the broader community. And so there is this, this kind of fight brewing over the issue of free speech and free expression. The protesters are asserting their right to protest and to express themselves, and the university is also asserting a right to to open it up so that everyone can express themselves in that space. So the university has issued a, a notice of trespass this last Monday that went into effect, and they're now taking their case to the court to try to get an injunction that would force the encampment to be dismantled. And that process is is underway, but will take a while even to be heard. I think the hearing date is tentatively June 19th. Hmm. So it's going to take a while for this all to play out. And of course, this week at U of T is, is the start of convocation. So I think the school was thinking about that timing as well, because that field, King's College Circle, is right next to Convocation Hall. That's usually a spot that's kind of prime, prime area for graduates there. Yeah, exactly. So U of T was hoping this case would be heard before June 3rd, and uh, that wasn't going to be possible because they filed a you know, very voluminous brief with the court, and there were more than 20 groups seeking intervener status in the case. So there's a lot for the court to sort through, and it's going to take a bit of time. Joe, you mentioned that faculty has also gotten involved here. Can, can you tell me about that? From what I gather, what I've been told, there are about 150 to 180 faculty members who have visited the protest site at some point. And recently, in, in its trespass notice, the U of T made clear that anyone on the grounds of King's College Circle after 8 a.m. last Monday could be pursued under either the student code of conduct or faculty who were present could face penalties as severe as termination. And so that really got the faculty's attention because they, according to the Faculty Association, had never faced a threat like that uh, in their history of negotiations and relations with with the university before. Uh, And so they said afterwards that that actually had spurred more faculty to to join the protest because they felt as though their 
their right to to express themselves, to teach, and to to pursue what they call academic freedom had been infringed upon. Hmm. Now, there, of course, there's a wide range of feelings about this among faculty, and there's many others who oppose and, and would like to see King's College Circle opened up again. Yeah. Uh, I believe labor groups have also gotten involved here. Isn't that right? That's right. Yeah, the Ontario Federation of Labor issued a call to join a protest at the uh, encampment last week, and there were flags from several unions, QP, OPSU, steelworkers were there, and uh, they issued this sort of rallying cry, which is if you're going to come for the students, you're going to have to go through the workers. Yeah. I guess I, w- I want to linger a little bit on the university response here, Joe, Um because we talked about how they they had filed a notice of trespass, an injunction here. Uh, what has the uni- university said about why it has taken that approach? The university has argued in its uh, materials for the court that the uh, encampment is an infringement of the, the free speech and free expression and association rights of everybody on campus because there is a, a kind of a screening process in order to enter the, the circle that has now been occupied by the encampment. And they see that as an imposition that restricts who can say what they want and where on the university campus. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there's pressure on the university from all directions too. I'm sure there are many students and donors who are feeling uncomfortable with what's going on. There have been a few dozen incidents, I think, that have been reported to police as potential, you know, moments that have crossed the line. So it, it's a source of tension for the university. They're always worried about health and safety concerns. You know, if something goes wrong on their campus, they could be held responsible. And to have people living there overnight is uh, is not something that the campus has planned for. Yeah. Just very lastly on U of T, Joe, what have we seen in terms of negotiations? We talked about the, the demands of the protesters. Uh, has there been any kind of progress in resolving this? They've been at the negotiating table a few times. And there's, from what I understand, it's student leaders meeting with four members of senior administration, but not with President Merrick Gertler yet. And the U of T has now more or less made public what it has offered, which is to create a committee to study the question of divestment, which is what it can do under its policies, uh, and to improve its the transparency of its investments, and it has rejected the question of, of breaking ties with Israeli institutions because it just it doesn't believe that would promote dialogue or, or encourage academics to engage as freely as they would like. So the students have rejected that at this point, saying what they want are not committees but commitments. And we'll see how it goes. At other universities, they have been able to reach negotiated solutions. So it may be that they can get there in time. We'll see. We'll be right back. Let's take a look at other universities now. So I want to talk about the first big campus protest that we saw in Canada, which was at McGill University in Montreal. Uh, Joe, what's been going on there and and what has that protest been like? So McGill's notable because it was the first. And I think it brought together students from a few universities in Montreal. Montreal has a number of universities in that city. So students from Concordia, Université de Montréal, UCAM might have been there. It was fairly large and drew a lot of attention. And I think it's, it's success Uh, in terms of getting itself established, has been a model for encampments in the rest of the country. But recently, there have been a lot of concerns coming out of there. Uh, McGill President Deep Saini issued a statement last week uh, expressing uh, his discomfort with some of the things he's seeing there. You know, he mentioned that people connected to the protest had gone to the homes of senior administrators, and you know, with megaphones and chanting slogans. Uh, And in another case, he mentioned a senior administrator was followed by someone in a mask who, who came out of the encampment. And there was a, a protest in the streets of Montreal that ended at the encampment at McGill that included what he described as a disturbing image of what appeared to be a Jewish politician being hanged in effigy. And uh, he, he, he described that as really troubling. And McGill has tried to get the police to, to come in and break up the encampment. They've pursued it in court. They've been unsuccessful so far. So the encampment there remains in place too. Oh, okay, so yeah, a few different things that are happening there. Mm-hmm. And, and we should say the Montreal police have confirmed that protesters did go to a residence chanting. They said it was peacefully resolved. There have been a couple of attempts to get an injunction from a judge here. Uh, this, so this would be a, a court order basically mm-hmm. forcing the protesters to stop what they're doing. Uh, what's happened there, Joe? So there were two injunction requests at McGill. 
The first one was brought by students who were seeking to have the encampment removed, and their argument was that the encampment presented a threat to their safety, to their to their physical well-being, and the judge ruled that that was was not proved. They hadn't proved their case, um, and they had been seeking. Uh, an injunction that would have protected uh, in a huge area of downtown Montreal. McGill, it was like within 100 meters of buildings, so that's, that's pretty, right. pretty wide. And when you consider the, the scale of the McGill campus, that would be a, a large chunk of, of downtown Montreal. Hmm. Uh, the second instance was brought by McGill seeking an injunction on an emergency basis to have the encampment dismantled and to authorize police to, to do so. And in that case, uh, McGill... Uh, lost the ruling on the basis that the judge did not agree that it was necessarily something that needed to be heard uh, on an emergency basis. You know, for example, McGill was saying that the encampment was going to interfere with its convocation plans, which were were coming up in June, and the judge heard evidence that McGill had already found another location, an alternate lo- location for, uh, for for their convocations. And McGill argued that the encampment presented a, a health and safety risk. Uh, after hearing the arguments, the judge ruled that was not the case, that there had not been any uh, any health and safety incidents that would merit a, an emergency injunction. And so the injunction was not granted. Hmm. Uh, negotiations, of course, must be ongoing here as well. What what have we seen between McGill officials and, and the student protesters? Well, the last update we had was from McGill last week, and they... They seem to be saying they had offered to improve their transparency. They already disclosed their investments over five hundred thousand okay. dollars, and they said they could make their investments under five hundred thousand dollars also more transparent. So, you know, students could then see where the money was, whether it's invested in arms manufacturers or companies they think have a connection to Israel. Uh, and they would said they would be willing to study the question of divestment, uh, and again rejected the the. Uh, the call to break ties with Israeli academic institutions. Now, McGill says that the students basically got up from the table in those negotiations and stopped engaging. So that offer did not satisfy them. Hmm. Joe, there have been a few examples in Canada of police getting involved in dismantling the protests. Let's let's talk about this. Where have we seen this happen and, and what's happened? So the, the prominent ones are Alberta. The University of Calgary, and then uh, a couple days later at the University of Alberta, police went in and cleared encampments at both of those campuses. They were not uh, scenes of sort of ongoing violence in the way that the, we, we saw in the United States, but there were definitely scenes captured on social media of police wielding uh, batons. Uh, they used flashbang explosives in some cases to sort of, you know, uh, get people's attention. I'm sure it was very frightening to be in, and so mm-hmm. for many people, that that constitutes the, the you know, the use of violence against students, which for people at a university it can be quite a shocking thing to to contemplate. Um, so it's caused a lot of upset in those places, and I know at the University of Alberta, the president has been meeting with faculty, uh, and and faculty have called for an investigation into. The decision making behind the uh, the moment when police were called, and I think that has been agreed to. So uh, there's going to be sort of more more investigation al- along those lines at at, uh, at Alberta. And these protests at Calgary University of Calgary and University of Alberta they they were not going for too long before police were called in, right? No, they were really very recently established. Certainly, there was more time to pursue negotiations in those cases, but. In Alberta's case, I know the president has argued that there were reasons uh, to to act expeditiously. Uh, he talked about some of the tools they had in the the encampment being concerning uh, axes, et cetera, that some people have said are just part of camping equipment. But mm. he was worried about the potential for harm. People staying outside at night in a place not designed for them to camp can be inherently a bit of a safety risk. And I think universities were concerned about that. And there's always the risk that counter protesters might target the encampment. And then uh, you have two groups clashing. And if the university hasn't created a a way to, to prevent that from happening, they could be held responsible. So I think that was part of the concern. Just in our last few minutes, Joe, you mentioned a little bit earlier that we have seen some protests resolved in Canada. Let's talk about that. Where has this happened? So uh, Ontario Tech and McMaster have resolved, and UCAM uh, in Montreal recently resolved its encampment. 
So at McMaster, they published a, uh, a nine-point document that described sort of the points of agreement, and it addressed many of the, of the issues that have been the sticking points uh, everywhere in Canada. So disclosure, divestment, and, and, the, and the breaking of ties. On the breaking of ties, it, they did not, I don't think the protesters got what they wanted, but on, on disclosure, I think they got uh, improved disclosure and a, and a place where the disclo- the, uh, on a university website where investments would be uh, listed. And then they got a clarification on how they could bring a claim or a request to divest to the university's governing board. Yeah. And when we say resolve, then the protesters have, have packed up? The protesters seem to have packed up. Yeah, that's yeah. my understanding. And one of the schools you mentioned was UCAM, University of Quebec at Montreal. Uh, and this is interesting. What did they agree to there? So they were able to reach a deal with protesters um, where they agreed for its foundation to, to no longer hold direct investments in weapons companies. Um, I think they, they said they would be in favor of a ceasefire in Gaza. And there was also some question about what they've agreed to around uh, their ties with Israeli universities, which is a, a question for at many campuses as well. There, there's some some language there that the students are claiming victory over uh, that that it, uh, they would be implicitly breaking ties with Israeli universities that operate in occupied territories, and the university has said it would be uh, not willing to enter t- enter into new agreements with organizations that are not in compliance with international law. So, uh, how that actually plays out in practice, we will have to see. Hmm. And so, you know, as part of this deal, the students have agreed to uh, to pack up their encampment, which I gather is happening over the next few days. I think they didn't take it down immediately, but they're waiting to see that all this goes through the university's various boards, meetings, approvals, et cetera, before, before they completely uh, uh, leave the camp. So just lastly here, Joe, what does it say that we're seeing more and more agreements come through between the protesters and the universities? Well, the encampments have been going on for a long time now, so I think the the fact that a few universities have been able to to reach agreements is is a sign that that there is a path for all universities here to to be able to reach some kind of settlement with the students. I think that it's also worth considering that that for the students engaged in these protests, the the attention that they're getting uh, and and the uh, the media focus that they're drawing onto the issues that they care about is is a significant victory in itself. So they may not be in a hurry to to come to an agreement, but but we will see. They've said they've cleared their calendars for the summer and cleared their calendars for the fall, and they're in it for the long haul. Uh, we'll see. You know, it's not easy to 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 stay camping for months and months, and and for the universities, I think there will be more pressure as time goes on to to clear these up. Hmm. Joe, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. That's it for today. I'm Manika Raman-Wilms. Our interns are Aja Souter and Kelsey Arnett. Our associate producer is Manjot Singh. Our producers are Madeline White, Cheryl Sutherland, and Rachel Levy-McLaughlin. David Crosby edits the show. Adrian Chung is our senior producer, and Matt Frainer is our managing editor. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you soon.